And time for questions at the end. Uh, welcome, uh, everyone. Thank you uh, for coming to this important discussion about domestic violence, the Second Amendment, uh, and the Supreme Court case that was just heard by the Supreme Court last week called the United States Rahimi. Uh, this event is co-sponsored by the Duke Center for Firearms Law uh, and the Duke Law Coalition Against Gendered Violence. Uh, I see some of my students in here, um, but for those of you that don't know me, I am Daryl Miller. Um, I am the Melvin G. Shim Professor of Law here at Duke Law School and with uh, Professor Joseph Bloker. Uh, I am the co-faculty director, uh, faculty co-director of the Duke Center for Firearms Law. Um, we have our um, executive director, Andrew Willinger, uh, here as well. Um, and want to thank everybody for uh, their time. Uh, so I'm really happy uh, to have Cassandra Rowe and Elizabeth Sager, uh, two public health experts here uh, from the North Carolina Coalition Against Domestic Violence uh, to discuss these issues. Uh, Cassandra is a, uh, has a Master of Public Health from UNC Chapel Hill and has worked in global health uh, prior to joining um, the coalition in 2015. Yep. Um, and Elizabeth Sager is a 10 year veteran uh, in this space uh, of intimate partner violence prevention. Uh, she too also earned a Master of Public Health degree from uh, UNC uh, Chapel Hill. I want to thank both of you for being here. So in terms of the run of show, I'm going to uh, briefly discuss the status of the Second Amendment leading up to Bruin and after uh, to Rahimi. Then we're going to have a fairly free-floating discussion uh, between the three of us and then open the floor to questions from you. So on the law side, I'm going to start with um, uh, the court's sort of arc from Heller uh, to Rahimi. So for about 200 years until about 2008, the Second Amendment was uh, uh, mostly inert as a matter of constitutional law. There was no case in 200 years that had struck down uh, gun regulation. Uh, and it was mostly thought that the Second Amendment had to do with a well-regulated militia. That all changed in 2008 uh, in a case called District of Columbia versus Heller, when a four, five to four decision of the Supreme Court held for the first time that the Second Amendment uh, uh, guaranteed a right to keep and bear arms for personal purposes like self-defense unrelated to any connection with an organized uh, militia. In 2010, in a case called McDonald versus the city of Chicago, uh, the right was incorporated to apply to the states and localities. And so now every level of government um, in the United States uh, and its territories is covered by uh, the Second Amendment. Uh, and that's the way the law remained for about 15 years. Uh, the lower courts uh, mostly upheld uh, gun regulations using a two-part framework uh, that applied uh, some sort of categorical approach and then intermediate scrutiny. Um, uh, mostly the courts upheld regulation. There were some uh, cases that were struck down, uh, sort of laws that were struck down at the margins, but mostly the existing regime of gun regulation remained in place. Then last year, uh, the court decided New York State Rifle and Pistol Association versus Bruin. This was a case that had to do with uh, New York's licensing uh, permitting law, uh, what was known as a discretionary or a May issue licensing law. Um, that was struck down as unconstitutional, but the big stakes were this methodological issue. That is, how are the courts supposed to be applying the Second Amendment uh, in cases that come before them, whether they're challenged on the defense side or whether they're challenged uh, on the plaintiff's side. Uh, and in a 6-3 decision, the court dispensed with this kind of scrutiny framework that the lower courts had overwhelmingly uh, adopted and substituted its own test, stating, and here's a quote from the opinion, we hold that when the Second Amendment's plain text covers an individual's conduct, the Constitution presumptively protects that conduct to justify its regulation, the government may not simply posit that the regulation promotes an important interest. Rather, the government must demonstrate that the regulation is consistent with this nation's historical tradition of firearm regulation. So essentially adopting uh, what was sometimes referred to as a text history and tradition or a text history and tradition slash analogy approach because the court does concede that not every historical regulation 
uh, exists uh, with an equivalent in the modern era, that use of some kind of analogs will be necessary to deal with new regulations. All right, so fast forward to Rahimi, which was heard uh, last, um, uh, last week. Um, the lower courts, uh, seeing that this is a brand new day after Bruin, have been much more willing to overturn what uh, might be thought of as sort of settled law in a lot of areas, and one of them has to do with the area of guns and domestic violence. So in December of 2019, Rahimi and then his, uh, his then-girlfriend um, got into an argument in an Arlington, Texas parking lot. She tried to leave, but Rahimi grabbed her by the wrist, knocked her to the ground, and dragged her uh, into uh, his vehicle. And by the way, the record just has uh, the initials of his girlfriend. I just refer to him as his, as, as his girlfriend rather than the initials. Uh, fearful that his actions had been seen by onlookers, he got a gun uh, and fired a shot. She was able to escape, but Rahimi later called her and threatened um, to, uh, her with violence uh, if she told anyone about the assault. Three months later, Rahimi is giving a notice of a hearing for a restraining order and agreed to that order, agreed to that restraining order in court, including uh, the inability to have firearms. Uh, the order had found that um, Rahimi uh, possess, uh, posed a credible threat uh, to his uh, former girlfriend's safety. Rahimi then went on to allegedly engage in five other shootings over a span of two months, again in Arlington, uh, including shooting uh, uh, at a, a hamburger restaurant. And as a result of these uh, shootings, the police obtained a warrant uh, to uh, search his house where they found two firearms, which he admitted to possessing. And this is where the federal law comes into play because people subject to a qualifying domestic violence restraining order are prohibited from possessing a firearm under a federal statute, 18 U.S.C. section 922 G8. Um, <clears throat> the uh, prosecution, uh, as, uh, uh, as is uh, frequent in these cases, is brought by the U.S. attorney. Uh, Rahimi is prosecuted for violation of 18 U.S.C. Uh, section 922 G8. Uh, and Rahimi defends against the prosecution on the grounds that the, uh, the statute is uh, facially unconstitutional. And in a, uh, the lower court, um, in a case uh, called Rahimi, the Fifth Circuit declared that the prohibition was unconstitutional. It found that Rahimi's uh, does fall within uh, the people and the right of the people to keep and bear arms, and therefore that the burden was on the government to show that the prohibition on possession of firearms by somebody under a domestic violence restraining order is compliant with this nation's traditional regulations. Um, and although the government had supplied different kinds of analogous regulations, historically the court said that these were all outliers or, or insufficiently relevantly similar to support the uh, constitutionality of uh, the federal statute, called the DV law uh, an outlier that the framers would never have accepted, uh, and said uh, that the statute was unconstitutional. Uh, the Supreme Court of the United States granted certiorari uh, on this decision, uh, and argument was uh, heard last week, um, and uh, that's now where we can start talking um, to our panelists. So um, in terms of uh, gun violence and this particular type of uh, tool, which is trying to use the federal law to keep uh, firearms out of the hands of uh, you know, domestic uh, violence uh, or persons that are accused of domestic violence or convicted of domestic violence. Uh, maybe you can tell us a little bit about what was the, you know, rationale, what are the empirics, why was this uh, particular provision enacted um, based on what you know from the, um, the public health perspective? Yeah, I mean, I'll, I'll back up a little bit and kind of tell you when it was introduced. It was introduced alongside or as part of the, an omnibus bill crime bill that included the Violence Against Women Act in 1994. <clears throat> and so this, uh, you know, there were lots of things under this bill. This was really to look at uh, the dangers of firearms in the hands of a domestic abuser. Um, so basically possession of a firearm by a, they use the language of batterer, 
um, in, in the law, um, but that it, it's uh, a danger to anyone uh, who has committed uh, or is underneath a DB protection order, which we shorten the DBPO um, usually, uh, to have uh, access to a firearm, um, as well as the, it, it lists out a number of other kind of qualifying uh, uh, ways that you can have your fire that you should not be able to obtain or uh, continue to have a firearm. I think it's also important to note that DB protection orders are time bound, and this is actually a, an argument that was made by the Solicitor General when we kind of get further to talking about the case. DB protective orders are often not permanent. They're usually enacted for a period of time. Um, they're given at a, a point of time, be, usually before or while the case is being heard or for a period of time um, for the safety of someone who's uh, been a victim of domestic violence to kind of plan out their safety. So there's, well, again, we'll kind of talk about that a little bit more. Um, but basically it was that we're the, responsible for disarming abusers so that it does not turn into a lethal situation. Um, and I'll let kind of Cassie talk about some of the numbers that are pretty staggering about uh, the connection between domestic violence and gun violence. Yeah, so we know that one in four homicides in the U.S. is domestic violence related. Um, and the presence of a firearm in a domestic violence incident increases the risk of homicide by 500%. Um, and we also know that many mass shootings are domestic violence related as well. Um, so I kind of do look at this as sort of like an equation. So the presence of a firearm plus a history of domestic violence plus some kind of conflict or altercation leads to a huge risk of homicide and often multiple homicides. Um, and I also, I attended the American Public Health Association conference this past weekend. And just yesterday, I was at a really great panel on family violence and gun violence. Um, and one of the presenters um, spoke on how there's, for the first time, state level data um, are available on intimate partner homicide um, through the National Violence uh, Violent Death Reporting System. And according to a new study, um, states that have stronger laws regarding um, uh, gun, uh, gun protections for, for uh, gun restrictions for people who are under domestic violence protective orders um, and compared to states that have stronger laws, um, those with weaker laws have nearly double the rate of intimate partner homicides. So we know that these laws are important in terms of protecting people. And I'll give a few more stats just about the state of uh, gun violence homicide in North Carolina. Uh, the Coalition Against Domestic Violence has been tracking um, DV homicides and homicide suicides since uh, 2009. So we have a pretty robust database um, to pull from. And uh, just like looking uh, uh, at this year alone, there have been 59 DV homicides and 18 DV related suicides. Um, that's already a 25% increase from 2022. Uh, and there's still three months left in the year. And over 85% of those cases in 2023 involved the use of a firearm. So uh, I'll just interject here. I mean, one thing that's um, also um, not necessarily sort of picked up by just the homicide rates is the use of firearms as a, you know, as a tool of menace, right? Yeah. So even if, if somebody isn't shot, the fact that the gun is present, um, it, you know, is a, is a tool of, of threat. Um, even without, uh, so, you know, if we think of the entire universe of, uh, of, of potential uh, misuse of firearms by somebody, um, you know, in a, a domestic violence uh, situation, it, 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 you know, homicide is the, wor you know, obviously one of the worst outcomes, but it's not the only kind of thing that right. this kind of regulation should, it, it is targeted. Right, at. threat and control. Right. And yeah. so, you know, that's, I think, presence of a firearm, using firearms as a threat is also another way to control a victim or survivor of domestic violence. And it can be one more way that that person has, um, is unable to leave an abusive situation. Yeah, we often actually point to uh, leaving a domestic violence situation as actually the most dangerous point of uh, contact between an abuser and uh, a victim. So, I mean, Rohini obviously is not just about uh, this particular regulation. Um, can you tell me a little bit more about what um, state level kinds of regulations there are 
um, that aren't, you know, about a federal um, uh, prohibition, but uh, might be implicated by a decision in the Rahimi case. Yes, and I'm going to speak a little ineloquently about this because I'm not our policy director, but I will do my best uh, given some of the notes that she gave me when I asked her this. Um, so it could, <laughs> overturning uh, this would actually implicate kind of all of our state level gun laws. And we, we're also on, we've already repealed one of what we actually championed as one of North Carolina's best uh, kind of uh, gun control measure, which was the pistol permitting system, which was repealed back in March. Um, and that allowed the sheriff's department to do background checks in their own way on any uh, non-licensed uh, purchase and selling of a firearm. So any gun licensor has to go through the federal background check system, which does flag um, uh, domestic violence uh, DVPOs or uh, convictions, um, but any uh, non-licensed sale didn't have to do that. And so now it still doesn't, now it does not even have to go to the sheriff's office. Um, so that was a big kind of, you know, blow to our cause of keeping guns uh, out of the hands of domestic violence abusers. Um, but kind of looking at what this could overturn, uh, we do uh, in North Carolina, uh, uh, it our North Carolina state law prohibits people subject to ex parte and permanent DVPOs from possessing or purchasing a firearm. Um, and the ex parte is pretty important because that's subject, that's different state by state. Um, so the idea that the court, that an abuser can just go to the court and ask for this without the abuser to actually be present um, would be subject to a lot greater scrutiny in this case um, and could, again, keep guns in the hands of abusers uh, for a longer period of time before they're uh, able to get to the court um, uh, to, to get the actual DVPO in place. Um, and we don't currently, currently have uh, the ERPO's law, extreme risk protective order laws, but other states do, and we've been trying to look to other states to possibly enact one. Um, a lot of the kind of uh, mass shooting violence that has happened has kind of flagged this. Think of the main case where the, the shooter there had been uh, brought up to law enforcement, his workplace, mental health facilities, and that if there was an ERPO law in place there for uh, a red flag law to take in his firearms, there could have been different results. So it's in the news a lot. We don't currently have that, but the states that do have it in place would also be subject to, to greater scrutiny. Um, and, and if those are found, those could be found unconstitutional um, in that case. Yeah, and on the other hand, um, if 922G8 is upheld, um, this could actually lead to more states adopting laws that prohibit people with a um, domestic violence uh, protective order from possessing a firearm. I believe currently 32 states um, have some kind of law like this in place. And so, you know, hopefully if it is upheld, more states would adopt um, such restrictions um, and, you know, other uh, protective firearm restrictions like the extreme risk, risk protective orders as well. Um, because if in the states, the fear is that a law like this could be found unconstitutional, a standard of prohibiting someone who is deemed dangerous could, you know, help alleviate that concern. Um, so if this happens, and even in states where the laws are already in place, Enfor enforcement of the laws are crucial. Um, because just because we have those laws on the books doesn't mean that they're actually being enforced. And so oftentimes people who have had their firearms um, taken away, they get those firearms back. Um, or they're able to get new ones because there's so many different loopholes for them to be able to access firearms. So um, having those laws in place is important. Enforcement also needs to be happening. So... Um Let's turn to the oral argument um, and talk about the Rahimi oral argument. Um, uh, you know, what, you had mentioned uh, Cassandra, you know, uh, um, sort of dangerousness, and you know, one of the interesting things that came up uh, in the opinion, uh, in the oral arguments was how much uh, you know the court and the justices really seem to be focusing on this idea of of dangerousness. Um, I, I invite you to sort of you know. Um, uh, uh, comment on, on that aspect or any other aspect of the oral argument that, that really struck you? Yeah, that, that part definitely did, did strike me. I mean, I think the, if you did not listen to the, the oral arguments, the, solic the Solicitor General 
just was extremely concise, came back, had kind of the arguments really well outlined, and brought up this dangerousness kind of idea that the other lawyer just couldn't really compete with. And, and, and part of that is because Rahimi is, as you pointed out, shot at five people within the span of like 14 months. Like, is not a redeemable character. It was not a very good person to hang this case upon, I, really, because uh, his own lawyer could not defend the fact that, no, this, this man was dangerous and, and caused danger to the public, not just his uh, intimate partner. Um, so that definitely kind of struck out at me as it was, it's a little bit, makes it, I think that the Solicitor General made a really good case that DVPOs and domestic violence is not an arbitrary barometer. Like if you have a DVPO, like you are deemed dangerous. And so this applies here. Um, and that's kind of different from the Bruin case, which the Bruin case they made that is the, the shall not versus uh, uh, it, just that idea of discretion being more in place there. Whereas like this, her argument was like, no, this is really clear cut. Um, and I thought that was a really smart way to use Bruin and say, here's this barometer that you can use. Um, DVPOs, dangerous persons. So that struck out to me for sure. Yeah. Um, that was definitely an important aspect of the oral, oral arguments for sure. And I think that is generally a good standard to use if we can agree that somebody who is under a domestic violence protective order can be considered dangerous. Um, I do look to the future and wonder just about the equitable application of that standard. Um, Maybe, you know, setting a domestic violence protective order aside, how else will that standard be used and who will be deemed dangerous and who will not be deemed dangerous under that standard? Um, thinking specifically, you know, uh, is a person of color more likely to be deemed dangerous than a white person who have exhibited similar behaviors? Um, uh, anything else about the like? Where, where do you think where do you think the court's going to land? On understanding that you guys, you know, probably are not sort of court watchers by 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 nature, although maybe you are. No, this is uh, my first one. This was actually think... like it was very uh, yes. I'm not not a normal court listener yeah. too, and I was like just enthralled, especially with the Solicitor General's. Just it made it I'm like made it make sense for someone who is not in the law system at all, and I was like that was impressive. Um, so I think in the media that I read afterwards also agrees that they will probably uphold the, the standard for this case. It's just we don't know how narrow the, the ruling is going to be and if it's going to be like this little tiny cutout for DVPOs. Because what I'm worried about um, is for someone who is a more sympathetic character than Rahimi brings a case like this. Like where I think I've heard of there's cases coming up about like a regular marijuana user. Well, uh, a drug user is also subject in uh, 922 G to uh, firearm removal. But like, where's, so where are they going to carve out places and is it going to get overturned in some ways and not others? We don't know. So it's still up in the air for sure. Um, but I think we're pretty optimistic at least about keeping uh, guns out of hands of um, DV abusers that have an active DVPO. Anything else? Yeah, I mean, I agree. I, it does look like um, 922G8 will hopefully be upheld. Um, Rahimi's lawyer seemed to struggle a bit. Um, and yeah, definitely, uh, I, I think the, the justices were very critical um, of their case. So we are hoping that it'll go in our direction. But absolutely, I think Lizzie is right that that doesn't mean um, that there won't be a future case that will be more sympathetic. So uh, on that issue, like, um, would you have concerns? Like, imagine that you do get an opinion that does affirm uh, 922G8. Is there some category of, um, of policy interventions that you're aware of that you might think are, you know, effective um, that would be, that, that could still be under threat um, if, you know, if, 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 the, if the ruling is fairly narrow on, yeah, this particular type of person can be prevented from having a firearm, but not this other person, or, I mean, what, what are the implications um, for other parts of what do you think, see as, you know, uh, uh, <clears throat> rational sort of, gut, you know, um, domestic violence prevention policy? Again, not not <laughs> the policy expert here. Right. 
Um, I think yeah. depending on how narrow it is, because I, th I believe currently um, folks who are um, who have a misdemeanor conviction of a domestic violence uh, violation mm -hmm. um, are also subject to the firearm restriction. So if this if um, if this law is upheld, but is only specifically for domestic violence protective orders, that could necessarily leave like misdemeanor convictions for domestic violence orders kind of up in the air mm -hmm. and up for a challenge as well, because just because somebody has a misdemeanor conviction does not mean that they're currently under a domestic violence protective order. Right. And those are, like Lizzie said, it temporary. Um, so I think that we would need to, you know, seek to strengthen um, policies like that as well. And I do think other states' ERPO laws are also still at risk. Uh, I think, yeah, there's just a narrow reading would still means strengthening a lot of, of arguments around the need for right. Reviews. Yeah. There, there's been some, like with the pistol permit repeal, there was kind of an addition of a uh, DV uh, specific crime statute that was introduced, but it, to, to uh, that would flag the federal background check process because the way it's currently written, if it's just violence against women, which is what's usually been used, it actually as a misdemeanor does not um, get to the level of uh, needing a federal background check. And we're already not sure that law enforcement has been educated to be able to use this uh, procedure um, or the new statute. So there's already like things that we're having to look at at a state level um, kind of beyond this, but it would definitely get complicated um, either way. And I, I guess that's you know relevant to, to my last question, and sort of open it up to the to the floor about uh, from from the, the students, which is um, so. I mean, I'm fairly bullish uh, uh, as well that I think the court, at least by the the timber of the argument, um, no one seemed to be really. Uh, willing to say, that, yeah, this is unconstitutional. And one of the strange things that um, that I noticed uh, was just how little, you know, history was part of the oral argument. They didn't spend a lot of time saying, well, a domestic violence restraining order is like a surety law in 1791, or try to say, you know, a domestic violence uh, restraining order is like this other kind of you know, regulation on uh, guns in the hands of intoxicated persons or something. So there was a, it was a, a it was a, it was strange. You have this sort of bold announcement in the Bruin case about, you know, everything's going to run through this sort of history and analogy approach. And then you have an oral argument that isn't really that about history. It's more about if we strike this down, what are the, what's going to be the consequences? Are we going to allow, you know, uh, is it going to mean that dangerous persons are going to have firearms? Is it going to be, uh, mean that we uh, are completely uh, uh, unable to uh, prevent um, gun use in a domestic violence situation? So it was really peculiar that that sense. But, um, you know, I've been wrong before, and I'm sure I'll be wrong again. <laughs> so if the court ended up striking down uh, 922 G8, um, how do you think your, you know, how is your sort of, organization thinking about what the next steps would be. Yeah, I mean, it would be kind of our policy team would immediately be talking to domestic advocates across the state about the new ruling and what that means. Um, and it would honestly be around safety planning. We talked about how like leaving uh, domestic violence situations are often the most dangerous. Well, that's going to have to kind of take into account uh, how how we how we do safety planning um, with with uh, victims of abuse across the state and how that that uh, how we safety plan for firearms access. Uh, uh, yeah, can you educate us a little bit about what I mean? That that's a term that you yeah. know, what is what, so what is safety planning? Yeah, what is that? safety planning is basically a DV advocate working with uh, someone who comes into uh, a, a local organization about how can they. I mean, it's as easy as it sounds, like how do you make a plan to ensure your safety mm -hmm. um, at the hands of abuse? A lot of people cannot leave uh, an abusive situation for a number of reasons, but how can they make it safer for them to stay, to protect their kids, whatever they reason for their financial security, um, et cetera. And so then making a kind of longer term plan for their safety. Who can you go stay with if this, if something's happening? Um, who can you reach out to? How can you, how can we contact you? Can we call and say, we're your doctor's office uh, with, with results? from your test forever. So mm -hmm. Cassie may be able to do, explain more, but 
No, I think I think you did a good job. And I think of safety planning as kind of a harm reduction strategy. Mm -hmm. We know that people who are experiencing domestic violence, it is hard to keep them safe, but there are ways that they can be safer. So mm -hmm. depending on their very specific circumstances, and that may look like, OK, um, my partner is preventing me from going to work. And so therefore, this person has no access to money and that prevents them from a lot of things in their life. Okay, can we help this person get a car, get access to a bus so that they're able to get to work on their own without their partner? Um, that can, you know, it's as specific as that. And for somebody who knows that their partner is violent and there is a gun in the home, we would talk with that person about, okay, what are some strategies we can use to keep you safer given the fact that there is a gun in the home and we know that risks, that increases the risk of homicide by 500%. Is it possible to remove the gun from the home or would that actually cause put you in more danger? Um, talking through those specifics and really trusting survivors gut instincts is is super important. Um, but, yeah, it's just talking with the survivor about the specific circumstances of their life and how we can help them be a little bit safer. Terrific. Well, I think we can, um, you know, take some questions from from the audience. I'm sure that they, they have many um, and uh, happy to sort of discuss uh, any aspect of the opinion or um, uh, this issue. Yeah, so the uh, concurring judge in the circuit courts kind of argued that essentially protective orders are too easy to get and are granted essentially automatically. I was wondering in your guys' experience if that's really the case and kind of how that process goes. For anything to get through the court system and in front of a judge is a process that involves so many steps that it is not just given out freely. Um, and I think the I can't remember the exact statistic that the Solicitor General pointed to, but there was it was only 60% of DVPOs that were uh, asked for were actually granted. So that does does show that like it goes through a process of, of, of more than discretion of really having evidence to say that this is happening and so you're getting obtaining this order. Um, yeah, that so my understanding is that that it is and from my own experience of working with with survivors and kind of past work or hearing from my colleagues is that that is not not the case. Like it is mm -hmm. difficult enough to even get to the system right. uh, is is a barrier for most people. We know that, you know, intimate partner violence is hugely underreported. So for it to get to that point where you actually request the DVPO, it is at a point with evidence that obtaining that, that, yeah, that argument doesn't bode well with it. It doesn't correspond with what I, what I know. Yeah, I completely agree. And yeah, if 60% of DVPOs are actually granted, you have to think about what it actually took for that person to get all the way there when they're in a relationship that is controlling many aspects of their lives and they're they're actually in danger of harm. Um, it can be incredibly difficult to seek any kind of services. Um, so actually getting to the point of, of requesting a DVPO is a huge feat. And um, being granted a, a protective order shouldn't be hard. From my perspective, I think it should be there. It should be a low barrier um, for people who are experiencing domestic violence. Well, thank you so much for coming. I know that you guys do really important work, so we're really appreciative to have you here. Um, you mentioned that DVPOs are only active for a short period of time, and so the under current legislation, the protection given the through DVPOs that's time sensitive. Um, is there any further protections for somebody who might be a repeat offender? Or is it just as soon as that time is up, it's uh, kind of fair game? I believe permanent DVPOs are a thing. They're just really hard to obtain. So most of the time, it's six to 12 month orders that are given. And I don't know exactly when, um, like our percentage of that case, but I, I do know you can obtain a permanent DVPO. It's just difficult to obtain. Um, and or they so can be renewed, extreme, right? Or you can re yeah, have them renewed. Yeah, and then there's the misdemeanor. Um, if someone is DV convicted conviction. of a DV misdemeanor, um, then those same restrictions apply. And just, just to, but the renewal process, I'm assuming, also then sort of uh, 
sort of renews all the kind of uh, stress and concern and potential, you know, um, escalation, you know, uh, that you were saying about going in for the in the first, first place, time. right? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. I noticed that, like, in the oral argument, um, the Solicitor General did it, like, she kind of worked within the parameters of Bruin instead of kind of, like, attack, like, more, I can assume that she probably doesn't really agree with it that much, and given they didn't really talk about the history and tradition part of it that much, like, I just wanted to hear what y'all kind of thought about that. It didn't necessarily surprise me, but I know that there's all multiple ju justices that have been dissenting in that, so I just wanted to kind of hear y'all talk about that. Yeah, I mean, I thought it was pretty clever. <laughs> Um, to do that is it's like, okay, they can't take issue if I'm using their own words against them kind of thing. Uh, so, uh, and I was, I was a little, I did a lot more reading up of, of Bruin kind of while listening to the arguments because I was like, oh, what is, you know, where, where is she pulling this from? Um, so I, I thought it was a good idea and to use the language of the Second Amendment itself and talk about like uh, you know, kind of the lawfulness of, or uh Dangerous and irresponsible. Dangerous, ir irresponsibility was the, the term that ended up being used. Um, and to kind of hinge it on, you know, we can make a distinct a distinction between responsible and irresponsible people, um, I thought was a really brilliant uh, path uh, for the argument to take. So, you know, I'll, I'll weigh in. Um, uh, I mean, one of the interesting things about it um, is... Um, I think, uh, I can't remember if it was Justice Jackson or uh, somebody else had, had given um, the Solicitor General an opportunity to say, uh, well, you know, maybe we should just sort of do balancing, you know, and she rejected that opportunity. And I think that was quite shrewd of her because it's unlikely that you're going to get, uh, you know, five justices to essentially repudiate what they just said last year about how this test works. So I think they... I, I think that um, I think the best way to sort of, at least I sort of approached it was that the SG was essentially playing the best hand that she'd been, been dealt, dealt mm -hmm. uh, which is all right. I got to use Bruin. Um, uh, I've been uh, I've been assured in the Bruin opinion by uh, Justice Kavanaugh, the chief, as well as in you know a kind of backhand way, Justice Alito, that that, that you know not, not everything is now up for grabs. Um, and so maybe, um, you know, maybe that there is a way to make Bruin and, you know, uh, what is clearly, um, a, you know, a modern concern and a modern regulation work together within the Bruin framework. At least that's how I kind of read the, you know, um, read the oral argument. Um, uh, she, yeah, she wasn't going to take, she wasn't going to take that. That would have been, that would have been a bad, um, a bad concession, I think. Uh, other questions? Yes. Matt, you were, were talking about the Solicitor General and kind of like the like, tailored arguments for why most of violence protection orders are like within a very finite period of time. Like that's what the protection entails. And so I'm just kind of thinking about how you're talking about you know, the continuous need for expansion of domestic violence protection um, in regulations. And so just kind of thinking about going forward. What that means if they're already, you know, heavily contesting this very tailored, narrow perspective on this, and how that kind of reconciles with the need for continued expansion of gun ban protection. Yeah, I mean, I I think I I want to go back to the need to really enact red flag or extreme risk risk protective orders. Um, you know, talking about Maine. Um, you know, this person, Maine has kind of what's termed yellow flag law. So, but that makes it a lot harder for someone who has, you know, people in their life who's very concerned about them and knows that they have access to guns to actually, you know, get them help and get their guns taken away from them. Whereas with a red flag law, it allows, you know, families or loved ones to go straight to the courts and ask them to take someone's guns away. And I think that this would be um, I think that the expansion of these laws is so important for just prevention of mass shootings, but also, you know, prevention of domestic violence homicides as well, um, which they are both often, you know, very interconnected. Um, so I do want to see that expanded. Um, so I think regardless of what happens with this case, I want to see more advocacy for extreme risk protective orders. Do you think that uh, perhaps 
new first step, like a, a, a sort of be like a textual inquiry to see whether the second amendment even applies before we go into historical analogs, given the fact that it really wasn't mentioned in any sort of historical analogs in much of the discussion. It was really more focused on the dangerousness. Um, well, I, I can sort of field this and, and then um, and then ask what um, I think that the the question is so. I didn't detail it, but Bruin essentially, you know, when it says it's got a kind of its own two-step process, the first is this question about, like, you know, are you amongst the people that can claim, you know, or the activity that you, you're engaging in, is it even of Second Amendment concern? And if it is, then it pushes the question about history and analogy onto the party that's defending the regulation, usually the government. But there's this sort of antecedent question, the step one, uh, about, like, are we dealing with the Second Amendment issue at all? Is the Second Amendment even showing up? And so, I mean, some some of the lower courts, not in this particular space, um, but in other spaces have said, well, um, you know, uh, a person that is not law-abiding, for example, just is not part of what counts as the people. So you don't even need to like, find historical analogs because the 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 premise is that the person is you know this is not a person or or you know um, I think the 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 less contentious one would be um, you know seven year olds right you know seven year olds are not usually thought of as having gun rights not because of a tradition of disarming seven year olds but because like seven year olds just don't qualify in step one as like the, the people that have all the sort of panoply of rights of responsible law-abiding uh, uh, citizens. So it's possible that we'll get some kind of opinion like that. And I think it'll be quite revealing in some way because I think the Solicitor General is not only concerned about, you know, this particular case, but it's thinking about the uh, felon in possession law that says if you're a felon, whether not violent or nonviolent, um, you can pre be prescribed from having a firearm. There's a law, federal law, uh, prohibits uh, persons that are undocumented uh, in the country from possessing a firearm or persons, uh, you know, uh, Andrew, I think, just uh, posted a, a blog post on persons that uh, have been dishonorably discharged, right, from having firearms. So there's a, there's a kind of question about the capacity of the step one to talk about who the people are before we even get to this analogical process. I don't know if you have thoughts on, you know, maybe about why the court, um, you know, spent so much time sort of thinking about not just dangerousness, but also uh, persons that are irresponsible, for example, or law abiding, how that, that you think that sort of plays out. I do worry about the law abiding standard. Um, Actually, even more so than the dangerous standard. Mm -hmm. Of course, how we define dangerous also matters. Mm -hmm. um, I think if we can look to specific, you know, if somebody has a domestic violence protective order or a domestic violence conviction, and we can say that is someone to be deemed dangerous. Um, that seems fair to me. Um, but how else it's applied um, is yet to be seen. But in terms of law abiding, we know um, that there are far more, a far higher percentage of black people in this country who are con convicted of crimes um, than, than white people. So, and that is, that, that is inherently inequitable. Um, so that doesn't, I don't feel good about that mm -hmm. potential. Um, so I'll just share that piece, even though, you know, I am definitely on the side of restricting <laughs> firearm possession. Um, but if that means that white people who are not law abiding or dangerous, et cetera, are still more likely to be able to possess firearms, that doesn't keep anybody safe. So, yeah. Um. Um, but it seemed like the court left open the opportunity for as applied challenges to the statute. Um, and I guess I would like to hear your thoughts on sort of the bounds of the statute and sort of where it could be challenged. Right. Uh, all right. So, you know, for, for those of you that 
you know, this is your first semester and of like as applied versus, you know, facial, what are you talking about? So uh, in terms of the, um, the question about as applied versus facial challenges is constitutional litigation sometimes will try to strike down as, as Rahimi attempts to strike down a law all, in all its applications and say, this is, it doesn't, there, there's no set of people that would ever qualify uh, for this particular type of regulation uh, to be constitutional and therefore it is facially uh, unconstitutional in all applications. And so this came up in the oral argument a bit as well. And as applied challenges say, I don't know about the other guy, but you know, for me, this is unconstitutional. Um, and I think the I think the door that um, that the court was trying to figure out whether to open or not is, it, you know, it, it, should there be some kind of um, rule that would be like, well, I'm not dangerous, you know, that other person's dangerous, even in the in the domestic violence restraining order concept, you know, that it might be that you know that other person is dangerous and there's a finding of dangerousness and they can't have a gun under 922. Uh, G8, but uh, but I can. And I guess one question about that is, like, what do you think about the as-applied versus facial, and what do you think about this other thing that the court seems to suggest, which is this administrative problem, which is how would you end up figuring out what the restriction on selling the firearm would be in an environment where the, you know, the label doesn't necessarily uh, discriminate between a person that, where there's a finding of dangerousness and a person that that is not found to be dangerous. Yeah, discretion is something we've talked about a lot uh, with our policy director and like who who is making those discrepancies. And mm -hmm. and I, I honestly don't really have much of a, I don't have an answer. Uh, I mean, I just, I think it's a fair fair point and, and, and where, where that arbitrariness kind of happens, I don't know. Yeah, I mean, I think it would have to be like, automatically applied to all domestic violence protective orders for mm -hmm. it actually to be effective. Otherwise, I don't, I don't see it um, being applied well, especially when we already, there are already so many loopholes, loopholes, even in states where there is a firearm restriction for DVPOs. <laughs> um, you know, folks are still able to get guns in a lot of different ways. So I think it would have to be kind of automatic that that, that, restriction is applied to DPPOs. And uh, honestly, the Rahimi case, like, because of how kind of indefensible he seems to be, and, you know, he's pretty clearly dangerous, and his lawyer couldn't even say that he wasn't, right? Mm -hmm. And so that versus, I, I mean, the fact that that was the first case we got is kind of great, and at the same time, I think it does open the door to, like, okay, well, this is, like, one end of the spectrum, what's the other, and, and where is that put? Uh, and uh, I'll let you take moderator's privilege here because one thing that that I find interesting about the case, like in a, uh, like the DV order is not just about guns, right? A restraining order is about what maybe you could educate me about, like what what actually you know what are the contours of a DV order other than you know you're 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 not allowed to have guns either as part of the order or as the downstream consequence under federal law. So what other portions of an order? you know, affect what might be thought of as sort of constitutional rights. Um, con it, so it generally looks at contact with the victim. Mm -hmm. um, so physical, you know, digital. maintaining, yeah, physical distance, digital distance, you know, any kind of contact from, from the person. It's usually limiting that. Um, so, you know, that can... That comes into play with someone's rights in terms of like where they're allowed to go because and they do have to know you know where their victim lives and and all of that in order to know where where they can and cannot lawfully be based on their protection. And so order. when you say digital, it means like you can't like email them, you can't you know try to friend them on social media, all that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Okay. I mean, this is one of the, it's an important point because one of the things that uh, I mean, this is just me that perplexes me about the about the argument, and, but also about the issue itself, which is there's a bunch of other kinds of rights that we think of that are implicated by a domestic violence restraining order, right? You can't talk to a person. You can't get on email and email a person. You can't go, come within a certain 
the feet are frozen. I'm assuming that a DV order sometimes protects other family members. You can't go see your children or you know stepchildren or whatever. So what is the gun thing doing? I mean, why, why is the gun thing make this a, like what's so special about guns as opposed to these other kinds of rights that are already being curtailed in some way by the terms of the order, right? Yeah, yeah. I, I think it's like you can specifically compare it to when it comes to maintaining physical distance mm -hmm. from from a person because that doesn't even necessarily mean directly contacting a person. You have to know that where a person <laughs> lives so that you can stay a certain amount of distance away from them. So that restricts your freedom of movement. So why is that um, fine? And we, you know, we don't have take an issue with that, but we do take an issue with the restrictions because, of firearms. Because of the Second Amendment. Exactly. Right. Yeah. But that, I mean, that's my point. Like First Amendment, right to travel, you know, um, substantive due process rights to raise your own kids the way you want, right? All those are implicated, too, and yet they're, like, not showing up at all as part of the litigation agenda. But as you pointed out, the, you know, those have been litigated for hundreds of years, and the Second Amendment really didn't start until 2008. All right. Other, uh, I guess, uh, a couple more questions? Yep. I'm curious how you advise your clients when they're you that they're considering arming themselves. Um, there often is an argument for you know, more expansive Second Amendment rights. So, also clarify, we don't directly work with clients, um, but we work with the, like, we help train the advocates who are working with clients. And it, that's part of safety planning as well. Um, so, asking about, like, access to a firearm is actually a part of that. Um, and wh what's our uh, the not the Good Samaritan, what's our reporting, mandatory reporting laws? Um, our DV advocates have to abide by mandatory reporting laws, so harm to self or others um, has to be reported. Um, but in terms of, you know, self-defense, I think, you know, I think safety planning around that would be just on a case-by-case -case basis. I think that, you know, as an advocate, you can share with a survivor, like, the risk, the increased risk of harm or homicide when there is a firearm present in the home. So I think it would be important to share that information with someone who is considering arming themselves. And on the other hand, if, it, if that person can lawfully possess a firearm um, and they want to for self-defense, um, I myself wouldn't tell someone not to do that um, because it's within their rights to. And if if it isn't with it, within their rights too, because it may not be for everybody. Um, but, you know, just providing information, telling them about any risks, and ultimately supporting, you know, what this person feels is best for them and is going to keep them safer is generally, you know, how we try to do it. I think that's a good question. So on that point, it's, a, it's actually a really interesting question. So the data on, like, a gun in the household is irrespective of who purchased it. You know, yes. there might be an assumption that the person that is actually right. Right. violent actually purchased the gun, but the whole the, it's insensitive to who it, how the gun got there is not part of the data set about figuring out the likelihood that however the gun is there, whether it's going to be used in a, a violent situation to commit a homicide against the, you know, the... Yeah, the, the data only shows yeah. that the abuser will, use, will yeah. want to use it. But. Exactly, because it's, it's not necessarily talking about, like, this. someone in this household obtained a firearm in order to murder someone. Right. It's just the presence of a firearm. And, you know, I was talking about earlier this kind of equation of, like, domestic history of domestic violence, um, presence of plus presence of a firearm plus some kind of altercation, high stress situation, when that is happening, there is a firearm in the house to access and it can, you know, there may, no, may not be any premeditation, but the fact that it's easier to actually kill someone yeah, um, same, is what increases with the risk. Suicidality, exactly. like lethality increased with the access to a firearm. We got one minute left, any last questions? Well, seeing none, uh, let's thank our panel. I really appreciate it.